All right. Um, well, I would now like to call up our panelists uh, uh, to uh, join us uh, on our first panel. Um, Um, uh, our, our, we have, we have uh, seem to have lost uh, the president of the Federalist Society, Steve Calabresi. I'm uh, sorry, the chairman of the Federalist Society, Steve Calabresi. Uh, and so instead, um, I think we're going to have our president, Eugene Meyer, uh, moderate this panel. Uh, and uh, so I will now turn this over to Gene. Okay. Uh, well, well, thank you. I am a pinch hit moderator, and uh, I think the I think the panel though is going is to be extremely interesting, and very much looking forward to it. I'm I'm uh, going to be uh, extremely brief on introductions. Uh, we are going to start out with uh, Professor Randy Barnett, who's at, at Georgetown Law School. Um, uh, because of the limit of time, I, I will fail to give the obligatory title of his chair, which I don't, I think it's Carmack, isn't it? Carmack Waterhouse. Carmack Waterhouse, right, yes. Uh, uh, professor of Law. Uh, Randy has been involved with us for a very long time and has been extremely helpful in many, in many, many ways and deeply appreciate his, his being here. So uh, I, I think I will... Uh, uh, go, go ahead and ask, call him up and introduce the others and hope that Steve actually gets here in the meantime. Randy. That's really the way introductions ought to go. <laughs> here he is. You all know him. All right, so um, my, comments, my, my talk today is based on an extended project that Larry Solom and I are working on. Uh, unfortunately, that project has not developed at the pace that I expected it to by this conference. And so all the comments I'm about to make should be considered not only off the record, as always, but also very, very tentative. And I'm going to have to drop from these comments a lot of the sort of intellectual theoretical apparatus that we have uh, working for us uh, in, the, in the full project. All right, so let me, uh, let me just start. Stare decisis is the doctrine that a court should rule the way a previous court ruled, <coughs> even when the judges of the second court disagree with the ruling of the earlier court. In other words, in constitutional law, the doctrine of stare decisis says that a court should put a previous judicial ruling above a court's best judgment of what the Constitution requires. The doctrine poses an obvious problem for an originalist judge or justice. If a previous judicial decision reached an outcome contrary to what the original meaning of the Constitution requires, the originalist judge or justice is bound to rule contrary to that original meaning. In this way, the doctrine of stare decisis puts the rule provided by a previous judge above the rule provided by the text of the Constitution. Does originalism need a doctrine of stare decisis? Should not an originalist judge simply follow the original meaning of the Constitution where it can be identified, even when doing so runs contrary to previous decisions of the Supreme Court? To see why some theory of stare decisis is needed, let's first consider what's called vertical stare decisis. Vertical stare decisis concerns the precedential effect of a higher court's decision on a lower court. In the federal system, the vertical stare decisis effect of the decisions of the US Supreme Court are especially important because of what should be called the Supreme Court Clause in the Constitution. The Supreme Court Clause in Article Three reads, quote, the judicial power of the United States shall be vested in one supreme court and in such inferior courts as Congress may from time to time ordain and establish. The word supreme here fu functions not only as the title of the court, but also specifies the function of the court. It is the highest court, and its decisions bind what the Constitution calls the inferior courts <clears throat> that Congress may create along with, the, with binding the courts in the several states on issues of federal law. On this interpretation, the supremacy, the supremacy of the Supreme Court requires the lower courts to honor the directives of the Supreme Court, first of obviously in particular cases. But this interpretation also supports, I think, 
the rule that lower courts are bound by the Supreme Court's interpretation of the US Constitution, even if a lower court judge believes that the Supreme Court's decisions are inconsistent with the original meaning of the Constitution's text. When you think about it, do, you re do originalists really want lower court non-originalists disregarding originalist opinions of the Supreme Court? While I cannot present the evidence necessary to establish this claim about the original meaning of this Supreme Court clause, if it is correct, then in this respect, if no other, adherence to some version of vertical stare decisis is commanded by the original meaning of the Constitution. But what theory should inferior courts adopt? To simplify a complex subject, let me discuss two different theories of precedent that operate in the federal courts that I will call the broad view and the classical view. On the broad view, when a court issues a statement in an opinion such as we hold that X, then X is the law. A similar effect results from statements like the law is Y or the rule is Z. The broad view allows courts to announce rules that go beyond the facts of the case and the arguments of the parties. The broad view treats opinions of the Supreme Court like super statutes, the language of which should be applied by lower courts as though it was legislation. In my view, an originalist judge should, reflect, should reject the broad view. For one thing, it lacks originalist foundations. The early practice of the Supreme Court followed the English model of seriatim opinions, seriatim opinions in which each justice offered his reasoning or opinion for his vote and his vote only. Distilling the holding from multiple opinions required analysis of the reasoning of each justice. Until Chief Justice John Marshall invented the practice, there was no opinion of the court. So at least until then, there could be no canonical, we hold that statement, that could be given legislative force. Moreover, the idea of a judicial legislative holdings, which is what this view amounts to, to judges as legislatures over the lower courts, is based on a modern conception of the common law judge, common law as judge-made law, a conception of judging that did not exist at the founding, and therefore could not have informed the original meaning of the scope of the judicial power in Article III. In contrast, the classical view treats the holding of the case as the ratio decidendi. The gist of the classical view is the idea that the holding of the case is the rule that is logically entailed by the reasoning that was necessary to reach the outcome of the case uh, on the basis of the legally salient facts. This formula limits judicial holdings in two ways. First, holdings are a function of the reasoning that is necessary to the outcome of the case. Portions of an opinion that address questions or issues that do not need to be resolved in order to reach the outcome are discarded as dicta. Second, holdings are limited to those reasons that address the legally salient facts presented by the record. Reasoning that addresses factual scenarios that were not presented to the court should not be considered in determining the holding of a case. As limited in these ways, it is the holding or ratio decidendi of a judicial decision that provides the legal norm to be applied in future cases. The Supreme Court clause binds lower court judges to the ratio decidendi of Supreme Court precedents and no more. The lower court, lower court judges need not follow every jot and tittle of Supreme Court opinions but need follow only the reasoning that was necessary to reach the outcome on the basis of the legally salient facts. Given that federal courts are not formally ad have not formally adopted the broad judicial legislation view of stare decisis, an originalist judge is not bound by stare decisis to adopt the broad view of stare decisis and is free to adopt the ratio decidendi approach. In our larger project, Larry and I will address the difference between the proper role of stare decisis in a, is an ideal world in which most judges and justices are originalists, and how originalist lower court judges should operate in a second best world in which they are merely, uh, they are still the minority on their court. For now, let me propose two overarching principles that originalist judges should pursue in a non-originalist <laughs> judicial system. And in this case, I'm talking about lower court judges, the ones that are bound by vertical stare decisis. The first goal is the achievement of originalist outcomes. In a world of ideal theory, originalist judges would reach and justify originalist outcomes on the basis of originalist reasons. Yet where this is not feasible, originalist judges should still strive for originalist outcomes. An originalist outcome is an outcome that is either required or permitted by the original meaning of the constitutional text in contrast with an outcome that conflicts with original meaning. By outcome, I, I refer both to the bottom line, that is, 
judgment for a party or affirmative reversal of the decision below and to the legal norm created by the case, that is the holding or doctrine, the ratio dissidenti. <coughs> In a world that is dominated by living constitutional judges, constitutionalist judges, there will be cases in which the originalist outcome can only be achieved by reliance on non-originalist reasoning. Faced with this situation, originalist judges should write and join living constitutionalist majority opinions that reach the right outcome, even though this will frequently entail opinions that rely predominantly or even solely on non-originalist precedent or other considerations. Given scarce resources and time, it is not practical to write a separate concurring opinion every time a constitutional issue arises. But originalist concurrences should be written when they move outcomes and opinions in an originalist direction. For example, they can signal to the originalists on the Supreme Court that there is an originalist basis for the outcome that the lower court majority justified on non-originalist grounds. When a panel majority reaches a non-originalist outcome that is not required by stare decisis, then originalist judges should consider dissenting. A dissenting opinion can alert the originalist justices that, to the fact that a lower court has reached a non-originalist outcome that is inconsistent with a proper understanding of Supreme Court precedent. This message may well be heard when deciding whether or not to grant cert or when deciding cases where cert is granted for non-originalist reasons. A second goal for originalist judges is to place a high value on political and ideological neutrality. For the originalist project to succeed, originalism must have wide appeal. For this reason, it is especially important that originalist judges and justices be willing to reach originalist outcomes, even indeed perhaps especially, in cases in which the result is one that would be favored by liberals or progressives and opposed by conservatives or libertarians. Let me put this another way. The originalist project will be sabotaged if originalist judges and justices disregard precedent to support originalism when it leads to outcomes they like, and ignore originalism by relying on non-originalist precedent when originalism leads to results they oppose. Progressives and liberals are deeply suspicious of originalism. Overcoming that suspicion is a large task, but it is difficult to imagine that the perception that originalism is a cover for right-wing judicial ideology can be overcome if originalists approach precedent in anything other than an ideologically and politically neutral manner. Before closing, let me briefly address the issue of horizontal stare decisis. That is, whether the Supreme Court is bound to follow its previous decisions the way inferior court judges are so bound. To begin with, it's important to observe that the Supreme Court does not treat its previous decisions as binding in the same sense that lower courts treat Supreme Court opinions as binding. Of course, the court does periodically invoke a doctrine of stare decisis that attempts to explain when prior decisions should be followed or not, as it did in Planned Parenthood versus Casey. But in practice, it's fair to say that quite, like, uh, quite unlike the inferior courts, the Supreme Court asserts the power to overrule its own prior decisions, even if the precedent is longstanding and even if it has been reaffirmed on many occasions. For some justices, Roe versus Wade is currently and will always be in play. For other justices, it's Citizen United or DC versus Heller, and a host of other Rehnquist court decisions for that matter that are always susceptible of reversal. And lest we forget, modern originalism arose in response to the New Deal, Warren, and Burger Court's wholesale rejection of precedents that stood in the way of their progressive political agenda. This means that in practice, unlike inferior court judges, originalist Supreme Court justices, like all other justices, have the option of voting inconsistently with previous decisions. While other originalists may disagree, in my view, the original meaning of the judicial power in Article III does not seem to address this question. At best, it permits, but does not command, that the do a doctrine of horizontal stare decisis. If that doctrine should exist, if it exists at all, it's what it, it exists in what we call the construction zone, not as a matter of interpretation. Now, is there any role for horizontal stare decisis at the Supreme Court? At a minimum, I would say that Supreme Court justices should give stare decisis weight to previous opinions of the court that a justice is satisfied utilized originalist reasoning in good faith. The reason for this is epistemic. Originalist research is difficult and time consuming. And we cannot be confident 
of the conclusions of originalist analysis until it is subjected to genuine peer review by other originalist scholars holding different views. I may read an article that seems very, very persuasive to me, but if it's not in my own area, I reserve judgment until I see what some critic who works in that field says about that particular argument, because they're going to point out things that I don't know that that author may have missed. For this reason, originalism requires a division of labor between scholars who research original meaning and application in advance of a particular case or controversy arising, and an originalist judge or justice who must decide many cases under pressure of time. Once the court has reached a conclusion on the basis of peer-reviewed originalist scholarship, and I mean peer-reviewed in the literal sense, not in the journal sense, there is, a, is, is, a, there is good prudential reasons for an originalist justice to defer to that decision unless and until it is called into question by persuasive competing originalist scholarship. Having said this, like lower court judges, originalist justices need to make pragmatic judgments about when to write separately and when to dissent. The Supreme Court decides about 80 or 90 cases per year. It would not be feasible to write a separate originalist concurrence or dissent in all of the cases in which there is a constitutional question. Originalist research takes time, even when there is already excellent scholarship, but on some constitutional questions, there is virtually no scholarship. Given limited resources, even a lion-hearted originalist will need to pick and choose. The tactical question of whether to concur or dissent in a, in a short run must be made in light of the goal of moving us towards originalist outcomes and reasoning in the long run. Now, there's a great deal more to say about this than I can attempt here. And Larry and I, and my project is still in its early stages, as I mentioned. But I hope these remarks suggest that even originalists who believe that the rule of judges can never trump the rule provided by the original meaning of the Constitution itself, by which I mean originalists like me, need to come to grips with how virtuous originalist justi judges and justices should comport themselves in a principled manner in a world of imperfect knowledge of what original meaning requires, as well as a world of collegial courts that for now are still dominated by non-originalists. Thank you. Thank you, Randy. Uh, next, we have uh, Professor Randy Cazell from Notre Dame Law School. Randy. Thank you. Thank you so much for the opportunity to be here today, especially with such an outstanding group of panelists. Uh, I personally tend to think any time is a good time to talk about precedent, but I think right now is a really good time to talk about precedent because I think 2019 turned out to have been a really pivotal year in the relationship between originalism and stare decisis at the US Supreme Court. And so that's what I'd like to talk about today. Uh, the intersection of judicial and scholarly thinking as it manifested itself in 2019. So let me start with some context. Over the past three decades, the doctrine of stare decisis has received a lot of attention at the Supreme Court, obviously, uh, especially true in constitutional cases, and that's gonna be the focus of my remarks here today. We've had high profile disputes on issues from campaign speech to labor union financing to abortion regulation to Miranda warnings and on and on and on. And attitudes toward precedent have also become a focal point at confirmation hearings for presumptive Supreme Court justices. Strikingly though, for all the attention that's been paid to precedent and for all the discussions of stare decisis, the Supreme Court hasn't paid much attention to the baseline legitimacy and foundations of stare decisis. Instead of evaluating stare decisis from the ground up, the court has tended to take the doctrine as given, spending its time on applications to particular cases rather than more basic questions of validity. And that's true even of originalist justices like Justice Scalia. Uh, Justice Scalia famously described stare decisis as an exception to originalism that for him was grounded in pragmatic considerations. And in his judicial opinions, he accepted the basic legitimacy of stare decisis, even though in particular cases he would have urged the overruling uh, as an exception to stare decisis given the circumstances. What's interesting is that over this exact same period, the scholarly community has paid a lot of attention to the foundations of precedent. So some scholars argue that stare decisis is lawful and legitimate, even in constitutional cases, even when approached through an originalist methodology. Uh, others argue that stare decisis is inconsistent with and even foreclosed by originalism in maybe a large number of cases. 
And I'll get back to these basic approaches in a minute, but for now I just want to emphasize the juxtaposition between the Supreme Court's cases and the scholarly literature, the latter of which had been far more inclined to grapple with the theoretical grounding of stare decisis. But then came 2019 and a Supreme Court case called Gamble versus United States. Uh, and Gamble involved the Fifth Amendment's double jeopardy clause which limits trials for the same offense. For years, the Supreme Court has recognized an exception to the prohibition against double jeopardy for trials by separate sovereigns, like by the federal government and the state. The petitioner in Gamble challenged that exception, uh, arguing that it contravenes the Fifth Amendment's original <coughs> meaning and argue, uh, arguing that the Supreme Court should overrule its precedent. And the Supreme Court heard argument and it read the briefing and at the end of the day it decided to stand by its precedent. And the majority applied the existing doctrine of stare decisis and said uh, we're going to stand by precedent and we're going to emphasize here that an adverse precedent at very least raises the bar a challenger needs to clear by demonstrating that the evidence of original meaning supports his view. But Justice Thomas writes separately. And in his concurrence, he offers his own thoughts about the role of precedent in constitutional interpretation and in legal interpretation more broadly. And I think this is where things get really interesting. Because Justice Thomas starts to incorporate this academic work that's been out there. He draws heavily, in fact, on the academic work examining the connection between originalism and stare decisis. And he concludes that when a precedent is demonstrably erroneous, the court must overrule it. To do otherwise would be to elevate flawed precedents over the Constitution itself in violation of the judicial oath. And he puts his point in no uncertain terms. He says, quote, when faced with a demonstrably erroneous precedent, my rule is simple, we should not follow it. So deference to precedent is allowed only when the law is uncertain. Even then, just allowed, not required. Uh, Justice Thomas's Gamble concurrence raises all sorts of questions, including one that Randy touched upon, uh, what his theory means for lower court judges. Because there's at least an argument out there that Justice Thomas's theory should apply in full measure to lower court judges, given that they also take an oath to uphold the Constitution. On that logic, lower court judges would be bound to enforce the Supreme Court's orders in discrete cases, uh, but they wouldn't need to follow the Supreme Court's precedents in future cases, and in fact, they'd be required to reject those precedents when they viewed them as clearly inconsistent with the Constitution. Now, if that's wrong, it's wrong for reasons that Randy alludes to, that the Supreme Court clause, as he calls it, of the Constitution actually complicates this analysis and leads to a different understanding of vertical precedent. But at least for now, questions like these, I think, are, are still out there. Uh, but despite the questions, the thrust of Justice Thomas's opinion is clear. And I think it represents a major moment in the interplay between originalism and stare decisis at the Supreme Court. <clears throat> so what I'd like to do here is, in the remainder of my time, I'd like to just make three quick points drawing on Justice Thomas's Gamble concurrence. First, even if one is sympathetic to Justice Thomas's position, there's lots of room for stare decisis within an, original approach, uh, an originalist approach. Uh, because even if you think original meanings need to prevail when they're clear, that leaves situations when the original meaning of the text is uncertain. And judicial precedents can fill those gaps. When they do, we can follow Madison in understanding the Constitution's meaning to have been liquidated and settled going forward. I think that's a significant area of overlap for originalism and stare decisis, and we shouldn't lose sight of it even as we focus on the ways in which originalism and stare decisis might sometimes be at odds. Second, uh, notwithstanding Justice Thomas's concurrence, I think there's a structural argument for stare decisis, even in constitutional cases, and that the argument is consistent with originalist premises. Now, I should note here that some scholars, including John, uh, have argued that the text of Article III, and specifically the reference to the judicial power, authorizes the doctrine of stare decisis. The structural argument I'm about to walk through doesn't conflict with that position. It just focuses on other as aspects of the constitutional framework. So for example, life tenure and salary protection mean that federal judges are insulated from official and electoral control by design. While judges of the lower federal courts face the prospect of Supreme Court review, there's no tribunal supreme to the Supreme Court, right? Nobody reviewing the Supreme Court's judgments. So if the justices are, are to face constraints on their decision making, those constraints need to come from somewhere else. The most obvious constraining force is the Constitution's text, which compels certain choices and takes other choices off the table. But the Constitution contains its share of generalities and uncertainties, and that's no new phenomenon. 
it was always understood that the Constitution would be underspecified in many respects, which is what gave rise to Madison's reflections on liquidation. So that creates concerns about leaving the justices without a meaningful source of constraint in some subset of cases. That's where precedent comes in. Going back to the founding era and before, prominent commentators described precedent as a tool for providing discipline and constraint. So with all this uh, in mind, we can understand the judicial oath to support the Constitution not only as upholding the document's text, but also as allowing presumptive respect for interpretations issued by the Supreme Court in the exercise of its lawful jurisdiction. Uh, that's just a very quick sketch of the structural argument for stare decisis, but I think it provides a response to Justice Thomas's contention that originalism is often inconsistent with the commitment to precedent. Finally, I'd like to wrap up by going back one last time to the Gamble opinion. Remember that in that case, Justice Thomas wrote a concurrence, but he wrote only for himself. Nobody else signed on. That should make us wonder what kind of commitment to precedent exists even among some other originalist justices. And so to illustrate, let's take a look at the oral arguments in the case. They prompted a really interesting discussion of the intersection between originalism and stare decisis, including some fascinating remarks from Justice Kavanaugh. So Justice Kavanaugh, during the oral argument, refers to stare decisis as, quote, part of the original understanding. He goes on to say that in his view, stare decisis is a, quote, principle rooted in Article Three, and a doctrine of stability and humility that we take very seriously. Shortly after that, Justice Kavanaugh calls stare decisis a constitutional principle, which seems to be in tension with Justice Thomas's account. But Justice Kavanaugh also goes on to say that a litigant challenging a precedent must show that it's not just wrong, but grievously wrong or egregiously wrong, which sounds like Justice Thomas's reference to demonstrably erroneous precedents. So these, again, are just statements at oral argument. They're not statements written in an opinion. So we shouldn't treat them as Justice Kavanaugh's final thoughts on the matter. But if he really does view stare decisis as having a constitutional dimension, that would create some fascinating questions about his theory as compared with that of Justice Thomas. Ultimately, while we have some ideas about his approach to stare decisis, we don't have a fully formed explanation yet. And that's also true of other justices, including Justice Gorsuch, who also offers some thoughts on precedent and gamble in a dissent, but doesn't go into the depth that Justice Thomas does. So stepping back, I think we're going to look at this Gamble case as a pivotal moment in the Supreme Court's engagement with the foundations of stare decisis and its relationship with originalism. But I also expect plenty more analysis from the justices in the years ahead. Thank you. Thank you. And our, our last speaker is uh, Professor John McGinnis from Northwestern. I forgot to say I didn't know the title of your uh, your, your, the, the title of your um, position at Notre Dame. And I don't know, remember John's title at Northwestern either, but John also has been involved with us for a very long time. So without further ado, I will call up John McGinnis. Well, well, well thank you so much. And thank you as always to the Federalist Society. Uh, in some ways, of course, uh, the uh, discussion here is a tribute to the Federalist Society because uh, when I first uh, came to these panels many years ago, there wasn't really much point in discussing the relation between originalism and precedent because originalism was so weak. It's a uh, tribute to the rise of originalism that precedent now has become, uh, and its relation to originalism has become such a central question because now uh, with the power not only of justices on the court but with originalist scholarship, uh, we raise continual questions of the relation of the hundreds of decisions in the Supreme Court reporters that may not be squared with originalism. So really, in some sense, even the topic of this uh, uh, panel is a cause for celebration. Uh, so today, I'm going to defend uh, an intermediate position on horizontal uh, stare decisis uh, that Mike Rappaport and I have developed. And by intermediate, I mean that it rejects the position of scholars like Mike Paulson and Gary Lawson, who believe that giving any non-epistemic weight to precedent in constitutional law is illegitimate. So we reject that. We also reject, I think, uh, the view of a lot of scholars, um, I would put Thomas Merrill and Henry Monahan in that case, who believe that such precedent has a strong presumption in favor of being followed, really regardless of whether it's in keeping with the original meaning. 
against the first group of scholars, um, uh, we argue that it is constitutional to follow a non-epistemic view of precedent and wise to do so under rules that attempt to capture the circumstances when abandoning a prior decision would be more likely costly uh, than beneficial. Against the second group of scholars, we observe that precedent is not as presumptively beneficial as the original meaning of the Constitution, but the judicial process is not as well suited to creating good constitutional entrenchments as the supermajoritarian constitution-making process is. It's therefore a mistake to generally privilege precedent over original meaning and substitute some general presumption in its favor rather than define some much more carefully circumscribed rules of precedent. Uh, so, uh, well, why? Uh, so, first of all, uh, as um, uh, Randy alluded to, uh, Mike and I believe that uh, precedent, uh, giving some uh, non epistemic rate, has, has been part of the general law or common law uh, in the Anglo Saxon tradition for a very long time. Uh, we think that, therefore, it is uh, that, at least given the authority uh, to judges to apply. Uh, that uh, as part of their power under uh, traditional power and therefore their power they inherit under Article III's uh, judicial power of the Constitution. I don't have time to go into the enormous uh, amount of, I think, evidence for that proposition in, in England uh, that is shared by uh, theorists like Blackstone and uh, um, uh, Hale uh, over on this side of the uh, 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 water. Uh, by both anti-federalists and federalists uh, like John Adams uh, before the Constitution uh, and by uh, jurists uh, immediately in the early republic to which we, I think, should look to understand the uh, working out of the Constitution. But let me do talk a bit about, uh, and we've already discussed uh, Justice Thomas's very important opinion in Gamble, about why I think that opinion is uh, uh, wrong in some uh, respects. Uh, there, Thomas recognizes that judges in England at the time of the Constitution applied, in some cases, a robust doctrine of giving a, a non-epistemic weight to precedent but rejects the notion that federal judges have any authority to follow a similar doctrine today in statutory and constitutional cases. What did, for Thomas, the difference is that the English common law was judge-made, but, and here I quote from him, we operate in a system of written law in which courts need not, and generally cannot, articulate the law in the first instance. I think the problem with Thomas's historical argument is that judges in England also interpreted written law in the form of statutes. And parliamentary supremacy debarred them also from, quote, articulating the law in the first in that, in instance in that context as well. And nevertheless, courts regularly applied uh, stare decisis, or at least gave precedential weight uh, uh, to matters interpreting the written law of statutes. Thus, it isn't actually, I think, true that the change to written law in the Constitution put the traditional rules of precedent outside the scope of judicial power the judges possess, according to Article III. And while Thomas argues that precedent should only be followed if the decision is not demonstrably erroneous, I don't think there was such a clear limitation or distinction applied at the time of the Constitution. For instance, uh, in a case of Ellis v. Smith, the question decided in 1755 in England, the question was whether a testator's declaration before three witnesses that it was his will and testament is equivalent to his signing the will to make it effective under the statute of frauds. Uh, precedent strongly favored that position. And as Sir John Strain stated, the case had been considered so many times and has so many authorities that it may be considered settled. But he went on to say he really thought it was wrong. It's a dangerous determination and destructive of the proper barriers of the statute of frauds. Uh, so I think um, uh, uh, there's problems with uh, Justice Thomas's historical argument, nor do we think, uh, unlike people like Gary Lawson, that the supremacy clause requires judges to ignore precedent. Uh, and the argument here is that it fails to mention um, uh, a precedent uh, as the supreme law, like statutes and the Constitution. First note how radical a position this would be. It would require justices to flout precedent not only in constitutional cases, but in statutory cases. Second, I don't think this is the natural reading of the clause. The concern of the clause is for courts to apply federal constitutional and statutory law as opposed to state law. 
It does not on its face disturb the traditional judicial power to apply precedent. In fact, given the long tradition of precedent, an instruction to apply precedent uh, would have been, uh, uh, an instruction to uh, disregard precedent would have been very odd. And I think a more clearer statement would have been required uh, to come to that conclusion, particularly so because the Supremacy Clause includes uh, clear statements getting rid of other common law authorities. At the end of the Supremacy Clause, they have the so-called non obstante uh, provision that says anything in the, this clause notwithstanding. And that, was, uh, that, that language, which seems sort of opaque to us, was meant to get rid of a common law uh, understanding that judges should try to harmonize laws, should try to harmonize state and federal law. And it says, no, don't do that. Uh, give federal law supremacy uh, even when you might be able to harmonize it with uh, a, a state law. Um, so we don't see anything like that in uh, the Supremacy Clause. And no one at the framing took any view of the Supremacy Clause as suggesting any sort of no precedent of view. But having said that precedent is uh, legitimate, I don't think the rules the Supreme Court applies today of overruling past precedent, I don't think they're mandated by the founding. They effectively create a presumption in favor of precedent, but that presumption isn't justified. Instead, precedent, precedent rules should balance the benefits of following the original meaning against the benefits of following precedent. Uh, in other words, since precedent is a common law matter, its rules should represent the optimal trade-offs in the specific context of constitutional law, something that actually hadn't been worked out at the time of the founding. And the benefits of following an original meaning are so great that the presumption should be against following erroneous precedent except in certain specified circumstances. Before giving some of those rules of precedent that I think we should follow, let me briefly recount the benefits of following originalism to show why that should really be uh, the presumption in our law. Uh, first, uh, as uh, Mike and I have discussed in some uh, lengthy uh, 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 law review articles, uh, the original meaning of the Constitution is likely desirable because it was enacted through a supermajoritarian process that gets a continental consensus. Supreme Court decision making is anything but a continental consensus, requiring only a majority of elite lawyers who live in the most artificial city in the United States, the one we're in now, uh, to arrive at a decision. To be sure, uh, uh, as long as Justice Scalia was on the court, they did represent four of the five boroughs of New York City, but that still might not represent quite uh, the entire continent. Um, uh, so um, uh, a second benefit of, from originalism derives from the clarity, predictability, and judicial constraint I think that it's likely to produce. Uh, Justice Antonin Scalia, among others, has emphasized that benefit. I don't think the original meaning of the text always leads clear rules, but I think it usually leads clear guidance than an approach that allows a majority of judges to interpret provisions based on their policy views. While this benefit may be insufficient to justify originalism on its own, it's nonetheless significant and adds considerable force to the argument that based on the likely desirability of the Constitution uh, uh, produced by supermajority rules. So it's another argument. And I think in particular this benefit's put into bold relief by contrasting it with a lack of clarity that generally and often comes from focusing on following precedent. The original Constitution and even its amendments, I think, are a coherent whole. Precedents on the court, however, necessarily conflict, at least at the edges, and often more comprehensively than that. They're often the products of different times and different eras. And even uh, when they're not, uh, Frank Easterbrook, I think, has observed and really shown that even on a uh, constant multi-member court, they're not likely to deliver uh, precedence because of social choice problems in uh, arraying their uh, preferences. This problem is exacerbated, and, and here I very much agree with Randy, by the court's tendency to treat precedence as going beyond the traditional ratio descendi and include dicta and doctrinal statements that go beyond what's necessary to the decision. Uh, and so that's another uh, problem, I think, with uh, simply following uh, uh, precedent. A third benefit of originalism that preserves the important role of the constitutional amendment process. An effective supermajoritarian <laughs> amendment process is necessary to update the Constitution while also preserving the benefits produced by the supermajoritarian enactment of constitutional revisions. However, non-originalism, especially when it attempts to update the Constitution, prevents that amendment process from operating effectively. 
A world where precedent dominates over originalism crowds out the amendment process, because it empowers the court to make decisions that are not unpopular enough to spark an amendment, but are nevertheless not faithful to the Constitution. Given these general benefits of originalism over precedent, the rules for preserving precedent over original meaning should be relatively narrow and focused on circumstances where following precedent has unusual benefits. Here are three suggested rules, which I'm not saying are, are necessarily comprehensive or the only possible rules. First, uh, precedent should be preferred if overturning the precedent would have enormous costs. Even if, and I think it, my tentative view is this is likely, the legal tender cases were wrongly decided, I think it's inconceivable that an originalist court would hold paper currency unconstitutional. Now, thinking about how to um, uh, employ this enormous cost exception uh, to originalism requires us to, I think, sometimes whittle away precedent uh, so that it only retains the precedent that has enormous costs. For instance, an example of this might be in the spending clause, even if we think the Madisonian view of the spending clause is correct as opposed to the Hamiltonian view, even the Hamiltonian view uh, has a requirement that uh, government spending be for the general benefit. So if we had that, it might preserve things like Social Security and other matters that getting rid of today would, would really have uh, enormous costs. We really can't imagine the court uh, uh, doing that. But it still may allow us to cut back on um, uh, spending uh, that's just for particular interest groups and w for which getting rid of would not have enormous costs. Second, precedent should be preferred if it's clear by now that an amendment would have been passed endorsing the decision had the decision come out the other way. I understand the argument um, that the court should overrule the precedent and let the amendment process take its course. But realistically, that would oppose the court to popular sentiment so much, I think, as to damage its standing for really no purpose. Griswold v. Connecticut might be a non-originalist prote uh, precedent protected by that rule. Finally, and this is where I, uh, and, uh, where I and Mike, I think, probably are close to Thomas's view in Gamble, uh, his view of the rule of precedent, but not for, uh, close to his reasoning, is I think we preserve precedents if they're not clearly erroneous uh, uh, and, and there's been some reliance on them. There really doesn't seem necessarily, given the difficulty of being sure you're right, uh, to uh, necessarily strike down uh, a precedent that's come pretty close to the original meaning, even if we think there's a slightly better argument uh, for original meaning in some other uh, respect, so long as there's been a, a, a reliance. But note that these precedent rules would not preserve a large number of precedents uh, that many uh, think sacrosanct today. I mean, take Morrison v. Olson, uh, 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 for instance, and the idea of uh, insulating administrators uh, from control by the president, I, something I think is a, inconsistent with the original meaning of the Constitution, and demonstrably so. Well, I don't think it has enormous costs uh, to make uh, all administrative agency heads responsible to the president. Indeed, I don't think anyone outside of Washington would notice uh, that they could be fired uh, except for the people uh, within uh, this uh, city. Uh, I also uh, don't think there will be, say, constitutional amendment uh, anytime soon or could ever be forthcoming to protect various high-level bureaucrats. <laughs> And, uh, and finally, I, as I say, I think it is relatively clear that this is, uh, uh, at least with respect to um, actors who wield the executive power, uh, inconsistent with the original meaning of the Constitution. So in conclusion, as originalism gains in force, I think it's completely legitimate and indeed a duty of originalist judges to restore the originalist meaning of the Constitution, except when there are compelling considerations on the other side. Thank you. Thank you, John. Uh, th uh, three uh, very interesting presentations. Um, uh, next, I want to give everybody a chance to, to, to respond uh, to, to, to the others. And I guess we'll go in the same order. So Randy? Great. Thanks. Um, 
First of all, I probably should mention as part of people responsible, part of the persons responsible for planning this session, that uh, Bernie Myler was supposed to be on this program, which would have added a different perspective than what you're preparing for. And we tried to get Gary um, or or Mike to come and defend the purest, uh, the so-called purest position on precedent that they hold, um, so that there were this all the positions would have been adequately. Uh, represented. Uh, Mike did do that at the lawyers' convention, and we, maybe we should have just paid, played a videotape of the talk he gave then, and that would, have, uh, that would have done that job. So I just wanted you to know that we do have some range of disagreement here, but there would have been a bigger range of disagreement if the original intent of the panel uh, uh, prevailed. Um, I want to um, address my, uh, basically direct my remarks uh, to John's, as would be understandable. Um, we agree about a lot. I want to begin by stressing uh, that I think his terminology of giving precedent non-epistemic weight is extremely helpful in this debate um, uh, or in this discussion uh, because that's what really is the disagreement about. I don't think originalists would have that much disagreement about the epistemic use of stare decisis that I described in my original talk, and that is where we don't really know um, uh, whether something is against the, uh, the original meaning of the Constitution, you don't invalidate a law based on that. And when um, a prior court has engaged in a, in a good faith originalist analysis, it would take some doing uh, for a subsequent judge or justice to say, oh no, you guys were all wrong and I'm right. Um, that's not to say it couldn't happen, especially if that previous originalist decision came under fire by, from originalist scholars and ultimately there developed a kind of counter consensus that that original decision was wrong on originalist grounds. But um, all of this is doing uh, is using stare decisis in the epistemic way uh, as an ep to perform an epistemic function, which I think it should perform and which we lose sight of if we adopt simply, if we, if we just take the talking point that the original, that the uh, uh, judge's rulings should never trump the original meaning of the text. Yeah, okay, except what about this? And so I think John's terminology, the non-epistemic use of precedent is extremely helpful because that really does distinguish what we're actually disagreeing about potentially and what we're not. Um, I think I have two basic disagreements or disagreements with two basic claims that he made on behalf of the non-epistemic use of precedent or stare decisis. Uh, the first has to do with his standard that he articulated at the beginning of his talk that uh, you should adhere to a non-originalist uh, precedent over the original meaning of the Constitution where it is more likely costly than beneficial to adhere to the original meaning of the text. Um, and later on he referred to optimal trade-offs between one, between costs and benefits. I mean, my reaction to this is pretty straightforward, and I think most of you would have a similar reaction or you would understand what mine is, and that is I just don't think this is judicially administrable. I don't think that judges are in a position to make the assessment in a reliable, non-biased way as to whether there are, whether the cost of adhering to precedent is really, um, uh, is, is more, the cost of, of adhering to original meaning is really that much greater uh, than the benefits of stare decisis. I don't think that's their job. I don't think that they're particularly, they would be particularly good at it. I would be very, very suspicious of um, their professed reasons for why they were doing what they were doing when they adhered to a non-originalist precedent. Um, and so I, don't, and I just don't think it's an administrable standard. Um, and, it, and, and ultimately what I think it will lead to is the problem we currently have, uh, and that is of um, a non-originalist ratchet, uh, where non-originalist decisions continue to get upheld um, over time, and we move farther and farther away from originalist meaning, original meaning of the text, and not back for uh, in, in, in its direction. I mean, John made a very, very persuasive argument on behalf of originalism, the benefits of adhering to originalism, the benefits side. Um, I agreed with everything he had to say about that. I just think those benefits are 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 too compelling to allow to be allowed to be overruled. Uh, by individual judges who make this cost-benefit analysis to go out, to come out the other way. But that's, I mean, I can see reasonable people disagreeing about that, but that's where I disagree with that. Um, I will say that under circumstances when this, when a judge in good faith thinks that's true, that the cost of adhering to a, a, a original meaning greatly uh, exceeds the benefits of the originalist, uh, non-originalist precedent, if, he really, if a judge or justice or court really thinks that's true, 
Um, I think the proper way of dealing with that is for the court to publicly announce that they think that's true, the way common law judges used to announce um, that they are bound by stare decisis and plead with the legislature to pass a statute to free them from the constraint of stare decisis. Um, they, I think they should announce that they, that they don't like this result, that they think it's wrong, and they think the Constitution should be changed, so please change it. And then even stay their ruling for some period of time. There's no natural law that says rulings have to be instantaneously, uh, judgments have to be instantaneously entered. They could stay their ruling to give the amendment process a chance. And I think the whole body politic would be much healthier if we could revive the amendment process as part of our political culture, uh, which has been done away with for a variety of reasons. Uh, um, uh, including that the Supreme Court, by a vote of five to four, can change the Constitution, and therefore it's much less costly to go through the Supreme Court to change the Constitution than it is to go through the states to change the Constitution, and so that's, that's the way it's done. But I think if the Supreme Court were to have some of these unpopular decisions on behalf of unpopular originalist meanings, but announce that they themselves share the concern, um, I think you'd see amendments, and, and amendments with a bipartisan support, which would re the, re reinvigorate the amendment process, which would be healthy. Um, uh, and if we, as we got a culture of amendment, I think, the, I think the problems of originalism and opposition to originalism would decline correspondingly. Um, I've had non-originalists tell me that if they lived in a, uh, I don't know if they were sincere when they said so, but they said if, if the amendment process was much easier, they'd have, no pro they'd have much less problem with originalism if it could just be reversed by amendment. It's only because the amendment process is so difficult that you need uh, to have living constitutionalism. Um, I think that could be ameliorated by this, in this situation. Um, the, the second thing is about um, uh, John's invocation of original methods. Obviously, John and I have long-standing disagreement about the status of original methods. Whether he, John and Mike Rappaport both believe that original methods are part of the original meaning of the text. Um, Larry Solomon, I, and others believe that if they have any role to play, it's primary. They could conceivably be part of original meaning if they really were widely shared the way the rules of grammar in English are widely shared. They could be part of original meaning, but generally speaking, that hasn't been shown in most cases. Um, they are most likely ways of doing originalist construction um, and should be treated as such. So we have that, but this is not the time to relitigate that disagreement. I just want to no announce that. He and I have that disagreement, and he's appealing to his theory when he makes this argument, and I, I don't agree with that theory. Um, but I, I want to make, I, I make a different point, though. I want to make a different point about how the common law used precedent, because uh, he did invoke examples from the common law. So as a private law person, uh, first, before I was a public law person, maybe, I, maybe this was a terrible decision I made to leave private law to come to public <laughs> law, but uh, I did it. It's done. Um, the, uh, as a private law person, I know that star, the role of star decisis is extremely important in generating norms in a common law system because individual judges make decisions um, and rules have to be generated by those decisions and then private parties in private law contexts have to rely on those norms uh, in order to adjust their affairs. And that's the way law is, that's the way law is made uh, in a common law system. Um, and so there is a real function in a common law system for a body of stare decisis. The question then arises with the innovation of our written constitution, uh, does that common law doctrine of precedent poured over, carry over uh, to a system in, which is superimposed uh, over that common law system, a, a written constitution? Now, John did address that. Um, in his remarks, and I will just say I view the role, the relationship between statutes, which he talked about, and the common law somewhat differently than he does. Um, I view, I, I, it's my understanding that statutes were always thought to trump common law, that, and that's exactly why common law judges would appeal to legislatures to pass a statute if they thought their doctrine of, promise, of, of precedent led them to radically unjust results, as I'm suggesting should lead to amendment process. And so statutes always were thought to trump precedent. I agree that courts still need to interpret statutes, um, and that's what John's point was, just like they need to interpret the Constitution, but that brings us back to the both the epistemic role, and I also neglected Randy's very helpful uh, uh, addition of the idea that sometimes uh, original meaning is underdeterminate and require, it might require liquidation to uh, ascertain a definitive meaning. Uh, that would be more of a metaphysical claim than an epistemic claim about the, na the nature of original meaning itself. Um, 
So for that reason, I think that uh, even in a common law system where, where the precedent had a, played a different role than it does in a constitutional order, and secondly, where statutes trump even the common law there in a way that I think the, Supreme, the, the Constitution should certainly trump uh, common law processes uh, in the constitutional setting, I also disagree with uh, that aspect of original methods. Even if original methods were a part of the original meaning of the Constitution, I disagree with what original methods really require. And that is part of my problem with original methods, originalism itself. It's not always easy to figure out. In fact, it's usually pretty hard to figure out exactly what the original methods were. Original meaning is hard enough. At superimposing original methods on top of original meaning just compounds the difficulty. Uh, okay. Uh, so, you uh, said your name. Yes, a few times. I said your name too, but it was to say something nice about you. So, uh, so uh, I'm probably going to be able to respond to everything uh, Randy uh, said, but let me make a few uh, points. Um, First of all, about cost-benefit analysis, it's very important to understand that we don't believe that uh, judges uh, should uh, operate with some general cost-benefit analysis, uh, just saying, well, the costs are too great here. They should translate this into a kind of rule utilitarian <coughs> set structure. So I've suggested a variety of rules, uh, not simply uh, ones, uh, not uh, simply a roving ability for them to decide uh, it's better in this circumstance uh, than to retain a precedent than another. I suggested three rules. Now, to be sure, some of those rules themselves uh, have some lack of, um, they're certainly not hard-edged. Uh, enormous costs, for instance, is sometimes difficult to cash out. But that's going to be true of really any uh, precedent rules. Even Justice Thomas, the, really the most uh, uh, anti-precedent uh, person on the Supreme Court, uh, perhaps has ever been on the Supreme Court, says, well, I'll follow precedent when it's not demonstrably erroneous. Well, even that's going to require judgment. And I don't think you can avoid uh, judgment uh, as a judge. Uh, uh, and so I don't think that is a, um, uh, necessarily a problem uh, with uh, the rules we suggest. And again, it's a trade-off. It's a trade-off. Uh, against having no uh, non-epistemic uh, weight to precedent. I think that's really quite problematic. I mean, if indeed the legal tender cases are wrongly decided, it's quite shocking to think that the court could overturn them uh, tomorrow. And I don't think it's really an answer to say, well, we'll, over we'll give you a stay for a while. Maybe you can pass an amendment to, uh, uh, to validate uh, paper money. There's a problem with an amendment process put under those kinds of conditions. There are sort of holdout problems. People are going to require uh, perhaps other uh, conditions uh, to get their support, all sorts of strategic uh, considerations. One of the advantage of a constitutional process that doesn't have that kind of immediacy is I think you're much more likely to get uh, good results and get avoid kind of Christmas tree amendments. So I don't really see that as a solution. Uh, so I think uh, I'm not at all suggesting that the rules of precedent are uh, a, for a perfect rule. There are going to be problems of judgment, but the rules of precedent, we have to remind ourselves, are only necessitated by a court that makes mistakes. A court, and a court is inevitably going to make mistakes, and some of those mistakes are going to get so bound up in our body politic uh, that we can simply not eliminate them without killing the patient. And so that's uh, my response to Randy on that. Uh, the other uh, things I think are a little less uh, important. Uh, so let me just make a, uh, for those, and I think this may be mostly of interest to those who are very interested in technical debates about originalism. Our position with respect to precedent is really not arguing that precedent is an original method. Uh, but the precedent is authorized uh, by uh, uh, the judicial power. And then the rules of precedent, like any general rule or common law, should take account of uh, the costs and benefits, particularly in a basic system. So this really, I do not think, is a chance for Randy and I to articulate our uh, endless debate about the, about the question of how uh, how to understand the Constitution. I would say that our originalist methods, just to, to, to push back a little bit on it, really depends, I think, on the view that the Constitution is written in the language 
of the law, that it's quite, uh, uh, would be best understood by lawyers, and that would necessarily mean that the best understanding of it in certain cases would bring in uh, legal methods of understanding. But I don't think that is really uh, the debate here. Uh, and with respect to um, uh, the debate about uh, the common law, I would say is that I think statutes are written law like the Constitution and the way uh, English judges and judges, of course, in colonial times dealt with, judge, with, with statutes are presumptively a way of thinking about how they thought about the Constitution. Moreover, there was no break. Once we saw the Constitution come into effect, judges uh, considered uh, a precedent, to be sure, not only judicial precedent, uh, but other kinds of precedent in, in construing the Constitution. So there's no sense that there was some sort of evulsive change uh, because of the written nature of the Constitution and the way judges regard it precedent as part of their judicial power. C can I ask you a question about that, John? Because it's my understanding that one of the common law principles was that statutes in derogation of common law should be strictly or narrowly construed. Um, because common law was considered to be a definition of the background rights of the people and then statutes were being an interference with those rights, if they were really violating the background rights of the people, should be very strictly and narrowly construed. Do you think that that principle also ports over uh, as part of the judicial power and so the Constitution should be narrowly and strictly construed where it's in derogation of the background principles of natural rights, let's say, or the rights retained by the people? Do you, do you think that also ports over? No, I, I, I don't necessarily think so because I think there may be differences between the Constitution and statutes. In this case, though, I don't see the difference between Constitution and statutes. The basic problem for precedent is dealing with a problem of judiciary, that it makes mistakes at some point, and it's, yet at some point those mistakes may be so um, integrated in the social practices uh, that it is a problem for the judiciary themselves to eliminate it. I just think it's, you already see the problem here, that you have to distinguish those practices at common law and how they dealt with statutes from uh, other practices at common law and how they dealt with statutes, and some of them are in and some of them are not because of the nature of the Constitution, and I would say because of the nature of the Constitution, that, the common, that, hard, that hard, strong, robust theory of stare decisis that's associated with the common law is not, has to be qualified by the fact that we live under a regime of a written Constitution. Mr. Grizel, do you have anything you, you nah, would nah, like nah, to nah. say? Nah, he doesn't have anything to say. <laughs> on this, you want, you he's want, only you the want guy, to He's only the guy that wrote the book on precedent, right? So what does he, got to, what does he have to add to this whole thing? I'm, I'm mostly just listening. I don't think my mic's going on. Can I borrow you? Yeah. Sure. No. Yeah, you can borrow <laughs> Depends on what you're going to say. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, maybe what I'll do is, is draw together a couple of points uh, that I think both Randy and John made that are really, really helpful as you think about the judicial and scholarly project of thinking about precedent, originalism, their implications, and their interplay going forward. Because I think uh, there's some important distinctions that are also either directly discussed in the Gamble case or invited by the Gamble case. And so just let me mention a couple of those uh, that I was struck by as I was listening. So first, Randy talked a lot about the distinction between vertical and horizontal precedent and the need for a different approach, potentially at least, to justifying both doctrines. And I think that's absolutely crucial. And it's interesting, as you look to the rest of the program today, I think we have a couple more papers that grapple with that later. I think Ryan's writing a little bit on that. I think Josh is writing a little bit on that. And so this issue is out there. Uh, and even now in 2020, Certainly there's been some really good work on it, but it's not fully theorized. And uh, Justice Thomas, for what it's worth in the Gamble concurrence, puts his point aside. He holds it off. He says, I'm not discussing uh, lower federal courts and state courts here. I'm just talking about the US Supreme Court. So it's a live uh, point that I think is really important, so I'm glad it was flagged. Something else that both Randy and John talked about is what I always think of as the distinction between the scope of precedent and the strength of precedent. So the strength of precedent, which tends to get the attention, right? What do you have to show to rebut a precedent that's on point? But there's this really important question of the scope of precedent, the universe of propositions for which it can be cited as authority in the first place. And this is the holding dicta debate or the ratio debate or what have you. And I agree that it's absolutely crucial that we think more and that the Supreme Court talk more about the rules of precedential scope. And 
and recognize, as Randy points out, that you can have rules of precedential scope. I think precedential scope in the courts is often treated as something that isn't really rule bound. You have a couple general principles, well this is holding and this is dicta, but you don't go further than that. And I think that leads to all sorts of problems with regard to uh, applications of precedent seeming unprincipled and these arguments that, well, you can get around anything if you distinguish it to death. That doesn't need to be the case, but I think there needs to be more thinking about the rules of precedential scope. So I was really glad to, to hear that uh, from both John and Randy. Uh, there's also another distinction that comes out of both of their comments, and that's at the heart of the Gamble opinion, uh, the concurrence, what the Constitution requires versus what it permits on the matter of stare decisis. It could be that the Constitution permits deference to precedent, but doesn't require it in some significant number of cases. And then we can talk about what should be our guideposts in that <laughs> space, right? That's a very different analysis than if precedent is either required or forbidden in those cases. And so I think that's really important to continue talking about going forward. And then the last one, uh, and it's talked about in, in Justice Thomas's opinion, is when the original meaning is not clear, and this is something Randy led off with, can you defer only to precedents that are reasoned on originalist grounds or also to non-originalist precedents? Right. And that matters enormously, I think, in understanding the dynamics and the interplay between originalism and stare decisis, because it raises this question of what you do with all non-originalist precedents. And let me just give you a little bit of what Justice Thomas says about this. So I don't know that he talks about it directly, certainly not as directly as some scholars have done, but here are two passages that I think are interesting on this point. He says, at one point, federal courts may, but need not, adhere to an incorrect decision as precedent <laughs> but only when traditional tools of legal interpretation show that the earlier decision adopted a textually permissible interpretation of the law, right? Traditional tools of legal interpretation. But then he goes a little bit further later in his opinion, and he says, written laws have a range of indeterminacy, and reasonable people may therefore arrive at different conclusions about the original meaning of a legal text <coughs> after employing all relevant tools of interpretation. I think that matters a lot, right? Is the zone in which, on Justice Thomas's view, and the view of anybody who, who, uh, who subscribes to a similar account of originalism, is it that when the Constitution is unclear, any reasonable interpretation can warrant deference, or only reasonable applications of the original meaning? And like I said, there's some language at least suggesting that Justice Thomas might fall into the latter camp. But in terms of the practical effect of some of these conceptual debates, I think that one's going to be one that we're going to have to pay more attention to, and we're going to see the court paying more attention to in the years ahead. Um. Okay, well, th th thank you all. Um, let's uh, open things up to questions. Uh, and I... Uh, uh, I don't see mics in the room. We have a floor mic. We have a floor mic, that's great. And we have uh, uh, a number for normally the moderator asks an initial question that's quite unnecessary in this crowd, I think. Uh, <laughs> particularly for an unprepared moderator. Uh, 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 Josh Kleinfeld. Hi, Josh. Thanks. Thanks, everyone, for your uh, uh, fascinating talks. Yeah. My experience, uh, peer review doesn't really settle things. Peer review just maybe gives a range of finite, plausible responses, seem to do battle perpetually until some paradigm shift introduces another range of plausible responses. I've just finished uh, writing a brief uh, blog post about the, the Supreme Court's quite recent uh, vagueness cases. Uh, Johnson, Davis, and DeMaia. And in it, you see, uh, particularly in, in uh, DeMaia and Davis, you see Justice Gorsuch and Justice Thomas fight a mighty battle over the originalist credentials of vagueness doctrine. Um, I was just reading Worman versus Hamburger on the originalist credentials of the administrative state. It seems to me but that- Such an evocative title for a case. <laughs> Worman versus Hamburger. Yeah. <laughs> Sounds like a recipe. Um, the thought here is that uh, originalist meaning, it, it's naive to think that historical meaning is somehow fixed or settled. In fact, uh, the originals credentials of any particular uh, uh, claim about the Constitution will be the subject of perpetual his, uh, dispute among historians and historically oriented uh, lawyers and law professors. And so if we take that on board, if we take that on board as sort of a fixed fact about the world, that historical facts are subject to dispute, what does that 
what, what would the implications be for precedent and originalism? And I'd like to suggest that it, it, um, it, it makes the idea of um, disregarding precedent to the extent that, say, a Justice Thomas would like quite alarming. Uh, one thing it means is that the Constitution's meaning will be even more radically unfixed than it is now if we, uh, if we focus purely on original meaning. Another thing it might imply is a sort of transfer of power from the legal community to the historical community, uh, which I think would be alarming because of some of the predilections of academics. Anyway, I want to I uh, <laughs> throw it out there uh, for something, uh, uh, something for the panel to address that... Uh, um, let me take a first crack at this. Uh, I have a feeling what I'm going to say John is going to agree with. We'll, we'll see. Um, uh, originalism, in my, as I understand it, is actually not a single theory, but it's a family of theories. And it's a family of theories that surrounds two basic principles. One is the fixatious, fi fixation thesis. And the second is the constraint principle. The fixation thesis is that the meaning of the Constitution is fixed, or the meaning of a written text is fixed at the time it's enacted. And the constraint principle is that that constitutional actors should be constrained in some way, shape, or form by that meaning. And that the first is a descriptive claim, and the second is a normative claim. And so I take the thrust of your question is that, supposing we just disregard the first claim, so we just throw out the fixation thesis, might that have an effect on the relationship of stare decisis to originalism? Yeah, I would say it would, because you're throwing out originalism, essentially. You're basically saying that for reasons that you articulated, you're just not going to, uh, the meaning of the text is not fixed at the time it's enacted, and therefore, obviously, it might pose a problem to try to follow this meaning that isn't actually there. So what you've just articulated, in my view, is a fundamental challenge to originalism. It is not, and, and obviously, it would have implications for stare decisis if originalism was, was false. Uh, on its, in its basic claim. But the first point you made, I actually was thinking of making it a similar point myself, and that is that peer review doesn't settle everything, because I think that's demonstrably true. As somebody who participates in debates, very lengthy debates with other originalist scholars about, for example, the meaning of the Ninth Amendment, the original meaning of the Privileges or Immunities Clause of the Fourteenth Amendment, um, and no one ever, I mean, people die, they don't go away. I mean, it's just like, this is a, it requires a Coonian paradigm shift to actually change anybody's mind because people are committed, they don't change their mind. So these debates go on. So I think that this is an astute observation that needs to be incorporated into the discussion. And I just, in the interest of time, didn't mention it. So let me just suggest that, but I, and I think this is actually where Mike and, and, and John come out as well, that really all that originalism requires in this respect is for judges to choose choose what they think is the stronger of the arguments. Um, they, there's not going to be, the judges themselves are not, they're going to be mostly consumers of this scholarship. They're not going to be producers of it. And they're like judges, what, what do judges do? They hear arguments from both sides and they pick the stronger of the, that's what they do for a living. They pick this, they don't generate the arguments, they hear the arguments and then they pick, they choose the stronger of the two sides. And in their own judgment, what the stronger of the two sides. It's their responsibility to it. And they make mistakes picking, but that's what they have to do. So I would think that the, the reason why I stress the importance of peer review in a real sense is it gives them two sides to pick from. It, it, it exposes them to both sides. They don't have to. It's really hard if you only hear one side of an originalist argument to imagine what the other side is. Uh, no, I can't do it. I, can, I can't really do it. Um, and I'm sort of, this is my job. And so I, and I don't expect judges to be able to. So the point of peer review is to give them an op, to give them the choices, and they can pick between my, you know, Evan Burnick in my view of the Privilege Immunities Clause, or Kurt Lash's view of the Privilege Immunities Clause, or my view of the Ninth Amendment, or Kurt Lash's view of the Ninth Amendment. Um, they can pick what they think is most persuasive, and they may pick wrong, but that's, that's the nature of uh, uh, our reality. Please go ahead. Oh, sure. So I'm still off here. So thanks, Josh. So I guess I would add to that. So I think your question contemplates a relatively broad universe of situations in which uh, two originalists would disagree, both applying, uh, trying, seeking to apply the originalist methodology, would come out to different conclusions. And if there's a broad universe, a relatively broad universe of those situations, I think it puts a lot of pressure on the question of what presumption we adopt. And so this goes back to the, que the, the issue that Justice Thomas raises, where he says, OK, in those situations, you may defer to precedent. But then the question becomes, should you? And what should you 
look to in making the decision whether to defer to precedent or adopt some other sort of presumption? Because we can imagine other presumptions. You could presume in favor of the validity of federal legislation in a Thayerian type of way. You could flip it and presume, uh, no, I'm gonna adopt a presumption against federal power and in favor of state rights. You could adopt a presumption of liberty, like Randy has discussed, or you could adopt a presumption of stare decisis. And so if we have a broad universe of those situations, it makes it all the more important to determine, all right, what is the plausible uh, range of presumptions and how are we supposed to think about which presumption to adopt? Are we just arguing them ground up from in normative terms? Do we think there's something in the Constitution that points one way or another? And so I think that's kind of the next stage of this debate in a lot of ways. Uh, so I would just make three points. One, um, that I think if uh, your view is right over large range of cases, it does show that I think a rule that in some ways we all we may relatively all accept that if you can't show a, a precedent is demonstrably erroneous, in other words, if it has some support, substantial support in the history, we're unlikely to overrule it. And I think there's a lot of, I think that might be, again, maybe, maybe Lawson and Paulson don't take that position, but I think that's shared, it's a sort of uh, not all for the same reasons, but I think is, uh, I think the predominant, a predominant, at least one predominant, one rule that originalists predominantly share, I think that might yeah, take I think, care of that. I think Gary and, uh, and Mike do take that position at, at some level. Uh, maybe for epistemic reasons. Right, right. for whatever, right. But, but, right, so, so, so I do think that, that helps. Then secondly, I think it's, there are a lot of areas where I think uh, originalists, in good faith, there would be very great support on one side of the proposition that are very important. So in a world where we were originalist, well, we, we essentially were all originalists, we would not get uh, the Commerce Clause, meaning anything that touches on economics. I don't think there's a good argument for that uh, on the other side. And of course, Randy has, uh, uh, I think, done a lot of enormous important work on that. I think it's very hard to figure out how anyone could say uh, that one man, one vote comes out of uh, the, uh, the 14th Amendment. Uh, in fact, of course, famously, uh, Harlan shows that, and they just ignore him in that case. So uh, a world of originalists really make a difference, even if it's not going to make a difference in each case. And finally, and this is, uh, I don't think we have much to worry about the historians. Looking at the way historians actually talk about constitutional law, in my experience, they're almost never persuasive as compared to the way legal scholars who are informed by history, because they really don't understand, I think, the central questions, which is we're trying to figure out what the meaning of a vision is. We're not looking at the general social movements of the time. Uh, so until they reform themselves, uh, I'm very confident that lawyers will be in control, not historians. <laughs> uh, Professor Strike. Thank you. That was a really great panel, and I have I, what I intend to be a modest question for Professor Barnett. Uh, in your talk about vertical star decisis, you gave two rules for lower court judges in a non-ideal world, and one of them is to try and reach originalist results through mechanisms which can, in, in, in some cases, may should include non-originalist reasons and non-originalist precedent. I guess I wanted to know uh, what is there, what was the, what would be the reason to not require lower court judges to make those arguments in addition to making the originalist arguments. And I can think of a sound reason why they should be required. So the virtue of justice is lawfulness requires them pursuant to their oath to try to follow the original meaning. And then uh, the, the virtue of, of transparency would require them to articulate that honest reason behind it. Right, this, this is really part of our project that dropped out of my presentation entirely, the answer to your question. Uh, I'll, simp I'll try to keep it brief. Basically, we think that on a collegial court, uh, where there is work to be done. Um, it is asking too much of judges to act non-collegially towards other judges and insist on their uh, language in opinions that they are basically in agreement with, uh, with uh, the outcome of um, uh, on originalist grounds and, um, oh, and never join one of those opinions. And uh, this, would be, this would be considered uncollegial by other judges. It would not be, they would not be treated well. Uh, it, and I don't think it's in, it's not in their interest. It's not in the interest of the agenda that uh, the ultimate long run interest of originalism generally that they should act in such a non-collegial way. And so Mrs. and there's probably, and there are other practical considerations in terms of the time that they even have to devote to writing what would have to be an originalist concurrence in every case uh, 
that is being reached on non-originalist grounds. I think that's asking too much of real world judges doing their job. And so for, these are all prudential reasons why they should, uh, they, they should be committed at a minimum to originalist results, but not necessarily to originalist reasoning. Unless, I said, there's a way, there, it, performs a, it could perform an important signaling function uh, to the higher courts. There, there's just, if you have the time and if you have the expertise and if you want to write a concurring opinion, <laughs> I'm not opposed to them doing so, but I'm willing to allow that slack needs to be cut so they get along with their fellow judges and do the job that has to be done. Professor Gerber. Thank you. Um, my question is directed mostly to John McGinnis. Uh, when I read Justice Thomas's separate opinion in Gamble, I, I was blown away by it, about how good it was. And I was surprised to hear you criticize it as strongly as you did, especially uh, when, as Randy pointed out just before uh, Jean turned it over to questions, uh, the U.S. Constitution is written. The English Constitution is, is not written. And if you take kind of a pre-originalist look at it, uh, um, the first state constitutions were written. The U.S. Constitution is written. And I remember hearing a remark from Chief Justice Marshall that said that, um, uh, I mean, Chief Justice Roberts that said that John Marshall used the fact that the U.S. Constitution was written uh, to get Marbury um, into law. And so I, I just don't see how you can uh, 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 fail to appreciate Randy's comment that the fact that the U.S. Constitution is written has to mean that uh, a federal judge's approach to precedent would be different than an English judge's. So I just wonder about that. Thank you. Sure. Uh, so the basic argument, I think that Thomas, the two problems with Thomas's argument, and so let me, I mean, again, I, 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 so let me begin by, by saying that there was a lot of Thomas's opinion I sort of agree with, where he actually got to the result of a rule one of the rules he got, well, we're not going to overrule something when it's not demonstrably erroneous is something I share. So it's not as if I think that opinion is worthless or uh, a, not a useful opinion. One of his arguments, though, I don't think is a sound argument, which is that he argues that the difference is that the English common law was judge-made. But there were statutes in England, and uh, just as... Uh, the, as he argues correctly, that the judges cannot in the first instance change the Constitution. Judges didn't think they had the uh, ability to change statutory law either. And yet, they apply precedence to statutory law. So there's not an evulsive change between the writtenness of the Constitution and other written laws to which, to which precedent was applied. And I don't think he sufficiently takes account of that continuity uh, by suggesting that kind of dramatic change. Secondly, in your example, of course, is that uh, Marshall, Marshall talks about precedent. Indeed, one of the interesting things, you go back to McCulloch, is uh, he sort of suggests his first argument for why we uphold the bank is not actually his complicated legal argument, it's actually a variety of precedential argument. It's an argument not only precedent from judges, but precedent from the cabinet, but he also, I think, does think, refer to uh, that it had been considered, as it, I think, had been uh, considered by courts as well. Uh, so uh, I don't think there's any sense, there's just no sense of jurists at the time uh, that the Constitution is a document that's uh, so different that we shouldn't apply precedent to it. I think most people understood the Constitution like a, as a, like a super statute that took precedence over a regular statute. It was written, but it brought in the normal uh, structures for uh, interpreting and uh, uh, written law, uh, as well as the uh, uh, authority, at least, to apply precedent to written law. So that's my difficulty with Thomas's opinion. Uh, it's that I don't think he takes account of the continuity that written, the writtenness of the Constitution, while I think is an extremely important fact, is not such a novel fact uh, that it displaces the ability of the court to apply the, the kind of general law that they have, authority that they have 
under uh, uh, under the judicial power of Article Three. Let, let me say something about this uh, invocation of McCulloch and and the use of precedent by the Chief Justice, as well as, for example, Madison, this president's use of precedent in his defense of his uh, signing into law the Second Bank of the United States, which is the the law that was at issue in McCulloch, also citing precedent. What was at issue there? There, I should just start up, say up front, there's different ways of interpreting what they were saying. So I'm just going to give you a different way of interpreting. It's not the only way. The different way of interpreting what they were saying is the issue was whether a bank was necessary under the necessary and proper clause. And that is a judgment call as to whether something's necessary or not. And it was Madison Congress, as the congressman in the first Congress, who argued vociferously that it was not necessary. There were other ways of doing it. Jefferson argued in the cabinet it was not necessary. There were other ways of doing things. And then there was a period of time in which there was a bank. Um, and it became, as a result of having a bank, uh, thought that a bank actually turned out to be necessary. Um, and so the precedent that was being appealed to here uh, was the precedent as to whether, in fact, a bank, in the case before the court, w qualified, uh, was within the scope of Congress's power to pass laws that were necessary and proper. Um, it would seem to me that past practices and experience would inform a judgment like that, and that's what Madison said in defense of his own view. Um, uh, Jackson, of course, in his veto message of the later bank bill, <laughs> Um, argued that there was no, um, re, there was, that, that, that we were not bound by precedent in the sense that banks had to be upheld. Uh, he said that uh, because in fact banks were upheld and then, you know, then they, and then the bank bill was allowed to lapse and then you got another bank and then other, other Congress didn't renew the bank again. And, and so there is no real precedent as to whether banks are in or out in that sense. He said, but what he said in his veto message was what matters is if it's necessary under the terms of McCulloch versus Maryland, it's a legislative judgment as to whether something's necessary or not, and I, as president, exercising my veto power, think it's not necessary, and therefore it's not constitutional, and therefore I veto it. Um, so I think that's really what was going on in the use of precedent there, and so when you have to be careful when you see people appealing to precedent, A, what is the precedent they're appealing to, and B, what, is actual, what work is precedent doing? Um, it may not be doing the work that stare decisis, modern stare decisis doctrine, is, is claimed to be doing today. Can I, can I just mention one, one point on uh, one other vulnerability of Justice Thomas's Gamble concurrence, at least as I see it, uh, that I haven't talked about. So his rule is demonstrably erroneous precedents must be overruled, right? And here he's drawing on this wonderful article by Caleb Nelson, written almost 20 years ago, where Caleb draws this out and does a fantastic job. I still think there's a concern raised by that argument. If you had a world where you were only within a particular interpretive school, right, so within originalism, say, then it seems to me that drawing a line between demonstrably erroneous precedents and other precedents is, is something you can do. There'll be questions of application, but it's achievable. I think it becomes much more difficult when you move to a world like the one we have now where you have adherence to different interpretive philosophies because then it raises the question, is a precedent that's reasoned in a way that you think is incorrect in terms of methodology, is that necessarily demonstrably erroneous? And if that is the case, then what it does is it undercuts the ability of a commitment to stare decisis to unite judges across interpretive philosophy. And I tend to think that one of the great virtues of stare decisis at the Supreme Court is uniting justices across interpretive philosophy. So that's my problem with demonstrably erroneous. I think it works really well within a particular interpretive school, but when you have a reality of interpretive pluralism and you have different adherence to different methodologies, I think it really hinders what I take to be one of the core virtues of stare decisis. May I assess a question about that? Because mm -hmm. I, I wonder if that's actually true in fact. I mean, people are going to... Um, uh, have, give preference to, the, the, again, there's a lot of precedents out there, to the precedent that's sort of inconsistent with their philosophy and how they're going to manipulate precedents. I mean, just again, uh, it, it, how, how, how could we go about trying to decide whether actually this gives a foundation for agreement or whether this is just gives a foundation for manipulation? And, yeah. and, and that, that's a concern. Number one, and then, it, and then for an originalist, I think is a real concern also by buying into that. If one of the great powers of originalism is its um, sense that you're following the text of the Constitution, you're giving up a lot uh, 
uh, once you say, well, even when the Constitution is clear, we're following, we're following precedent, and you're also opening yourself, well, you're going to be doing that when, when, it's, uh, uh, when, you, when you're yourself manipulating things. So those are kind of concerns I guess I have about that. I completely agree. Yeah, I think those are absolutely concerns. I think the only way to uh, meet them is in actual judicial decisions. I think you need a decision. You need decisions from time to time from non-originalist justices who say, even though this is reasoned in originalist terms, we're willing to stand by it, right? And I think you need vice versa. And I think until you have those things, then you're right. All the talk about the generalities of stare decisis don't really turn out to amount to much because you still say, well, what does it matter if at the end of the day all the precedents that you've lined up with are ones that are amenable to your interpretive philosophy? So I think it requires something of a ground shift and it requires a joint undertaking by justices across the interpretive spectrum. It's, it's not good enough for one side to do it and, and one side not, because then it just leads into these ratchet problems or the entire thing falls apart. Professor Salt? Yeah. Um, if I could just Mike. follow. Mike. <laughs> Randy Kozel, if I could just follow up on, on your point. So um, I agree with you that if we had um, sort of a well articulated, uh, uh, understanding of stare decisis that unified judges that would um, uh, have tremendous rule of law value, uh, and we certainly wouldn't want to undermine that, uh, uh, under current conditions, the second best world in which there's no uh, consensus on uh, constitutional interpretation and construction. But um, do you really believe that there is a well-articulated and agreed-upon approach to uh, uh, stare decisis, either horizontal or vertical stare decisis in the Supreme Court? So um, Randy mentioned two approaches, the sort of traditional ratio decidendi approach, uh, the legislative holdings approach uh, that, that would take uh, uh, sort of clear statements of the we hold that or the rule is form as part of the holding of a case. And there's another uh, realist approach that uh, historically is very influential. Uh, the salient legal facts approach associated with Goodrich, right, which says that the holding of a case is limited to uh, future cases that share all the same salient legal factual characteristics as the precedent case. Uh, Richard Posner recently articulated a view of precedent that would limit precedent to just its epistemic value. Um, and uh, that denied that there is a distinction between holdings and, um, uh, uh, and dicta. So given the radical diversity uh, uh, of views about what stare decisis is, I wonder whether or not uh, uh, stare decisis can play this role. And I, as someone who uh, writes a treatise on stare decisis, I just want to say that um, judges frequently employ inconsistent theories of stare decisis. Not only do they employ one theory in one opinion and another theory in a different opinion, same judge, the very same judge sometimes employs one opinion, one theory of stare decisis on issue A, and then a completely different theory of stare decisis on issue B. Oh, we've got a holding from the Supreme Court. They said their holding was X here. Oh, we're not bound by the Supreme Court because there are these legally relevant factual differences. So given, given all of that, um, what, what, it, what is the hope that stare decisis uh, actually is going to uh, 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 significantly enhance the rule of law? Yeah, thanks for that. So the hope, you know, you talked a lot about what I would think of as the rules of precedential scope. And my hope there is grounded in the fact that 
I don't see much debate over these first order questions of precedential scope uh, to the same extent that you have, say, Justice Thomas now talking about a different set of questions, the validity of stare decisis uh, in his Gamble concurrence. I don't know that these are engaged with as really as, as rules at all or as rules of the sort that can bind. So I completely agree with you that you see different practices from case to case and you see it in the lower courts and you see it in the Supreme Court and you see well, this is dicta, but it's not the sort of dicta we ignore. Or, you know, rationales are a favorite of me, are a favorite of mine, because you can find precedent saying the rationale requires adherence going forward, and you can find decisions saying no, the rationale is separate from the binding holding, whatever that is. But I don't know that in the scholar, uh, strike that in the judicial writings that, aside from a couple of, of notable exceptions, that there's the same degree of engagement with these as first order questions that you can really find a solution to. Now, certainly there's, there's the scholarly jurisprudence over how you think about rules of precedent, but I don't know that that's migrated into uh, judicial writing. So I remain pretty hopeful there that as there's more and more scholarly attention to the rules of precedential scope as rules, that we could actually get to uh, some consensus because I think ex ante, when you're not in the context of any particular case, I actually think there, there are a lot of neutral rules you could pull out. I, I don't think every rule in terms of the, how narrowly or broadly you interpret a, a precedent is necessarily bound up with one interpretive methodology or another. I think some are, but I think there's a lot of room for sort of a, a middle ground where we could just treat these as the rules of precedential scope, like we have rules of evidence, like we have other sorts of rules, and then we can at least target our debates over some of the, the deeper philosophical uh, areas of dispute. Professor Sullivan? Yeah. Uh, should I wait for the mic? Yes. yes. But it's there. Thank you. Uh, so this is a question I think primarily for Randy Barnett, though I welcome comments by others. Uh, Randy, you said that uh, the, the binding force of precedent should be limited only to those points that are essential to a decision, but often a decision will say something like, the plaintiff loses because of reasons A, B, and C, each of which might be individually sufficient uh, to cause the plaintiff to lose. But of course, uh, you can then say none of them is really essential because if A is eliminated, you still have B and C. If B is eliminated, you still have A and C, and so on. Uh, and a similar uh, question, you also said that uh, it should be limited to those facts that are also actually before the court. Uh, but often uh, court decisions will say things like, we must decide the case on these facts this way because otherwise we get this horrible or absurd outcome on other facts like, you know, the broccoli hypothetical in the... Uh, the broccoli in, hypothetical. In, 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 is, ...is an example of this, right? That uh, uh, that the, bro the actual broccoli mandate wasn't before the court, but clearly the idea influenced some to judge it. If you rule one way, you say, well, then a mandate to, to eat, buy or eat broccoli would be, uh, you know, would be covered. So I wonder how your theory would apply to those uh, two sorts of uh, issues. Well, happily, my co-author uh, is a uh, uh, writes a treatise on stare decisis. You may have heard of him. Um, and so I defer to hit Larry to uh, answer this question about the nature of the ratio dissidendi and, and how it works. So if you can get the mic over to him. So uh, Ilya, that there's, you asked two questions. The second question is about uh, the nature of uh, hypotheticals or counterfactuals. So if the hypothetical is part of the reasoning necessary to the decision, right, that is uh, 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 the consequences for a hypothetical uh, are the actual, in the actual chains of reasons necessary to reach the outcome on the facts, then that is necessary to the decision. That, that's the, the classical view. You need to have an account of overdetermination cases. The law deals with overdetermination in a variety of contexts, uh, 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 causation, and, and of course, uh, overdetermined reasoning is another such context. There's reasons A, B, and C for the decision. Um, and uh, the, the question is then, uh, 
uh, given that there is reason A and reason B and reason C, all of which are presented in the reasoning, all of which lead to the results, what you do in that circumstance in terms of identifying the rule. If A, B, and C all lead to the same rule, then that we don't have a problem identifying the holding of the case. If A, B, and C lead to different rules, that's a classic problem in the identification of the ratio de Chedendi. It arose more frequently in the era of seriatim opinions where you have multiple judges, each offering slightly different rationales, and you have to figure out which, uh, uh, what is the common ground. This is the problem of United States versus Marx, which is, of course, a problem in every case where you have seriatim decisions. And you have to, you have, to have a procedure for identifying what sort of the narrowest reason is. And that reason provides the holding of the case. If there is no narrowest reason, which there will be cases in where there is no narrowest reason, then the holding of a case is very limited, essentially identical to the holding you would get under the salient legal facts approach. It is, I think, a commentary, though, on American legal education that this kind of problem uh, uh, is uh, not well understood by most American lawyers because it is not covered in law school sort of incredibly. Uh, for instance, uh, uh, most law professors who I've talked to about teaching United States v. Marx say, I, I'm not going to teach that. It's too hard. <laughs> right? And furthermore, most American law professors, I think, have never had a systematic introduction to the law of stare decisis. So, so if, if stare decisis is going to play <coughs> the kind of role that um, uh, Randy wants it to play, and that I would like it to play too, you know, but in the way Randy Barnett suggested, then uh, we need to have a much better legal education on the doctrine of stare decisis. Could I, could I, add, one, could I yeah. add one point to that? So <clears throat> I would just add uh, one point. I completely agree with this idea that we need better education and we need just more attention to the rules of precedential scope as actual rules that we can, we can define and, and agree on. Uh, so I completely agree with that from Larry. His comments made me think of one other aspect of precedential scope, though, that I think illuminates the extent to which we haven't even reached some of the big questions, and it popped up last year in the Kaiser versus Wilkie case. So the case involving our deference, right? So if you think about, and, and I think uh, implicitly involving Chevron deference, if you think about a spectrum, you think, okay, think about an interpretive methodology, like originalism or textualism. Say the court uses that in a particular case. Does that interpretive methodology become binding, even presumptively, in future cases? Right. So if the court decides C.C. versus Heller in an originalist way, must the court now presumptively be originalist in all future constitutional cases or all future Second Amendment cases? Usually we think of interpretive methodologies as not carrying stare decisis effect. Right. But what about the interpretation of a particular statutory or constitutional provision? Well, we think of those as carrying stare decisis effect. How does this relate to Kaiser and Wilkie? Well, what do you do with Chevron and Hour, right? They're not quite full-fledged interpretive methodologies, are they? But they're much broader than the interpretation of a particular statutory provision. They inhabit this middle space. And there's actually a lot of law out there that inhabits this middle space. And we don't even have rules for how we think about these things. We have practices that have sort of uh, grown up, but without much thought. And actually, it kind of goes back to my question of why I have hope, you start to see some debate about this in the Kaiser case. Right? Justice Gorsuch writes, and he says, I'm not so sure whether something like Chevron or Auer, uh, you know, they're talking about Auer, I'm not so sure that something like this warrants stare decisis effect given its nature. So I think we're on our way, we're just getting there sort of slowly. No, but we're being recorded, so we need to have a microphone. Uh, James Maxiner, University of Baltimore. Uh, 
One, I haven't heard the term, term forms of action used at all. When Professor Barnett's talking about the 18th century English judges, you got to include that. Two, the term ratio is totally That's Professor McGinnis talking about oh, that. Oh, well, I thought I'm getting you credit for going back and, okay. <laughs> and limiting it. Um, uh, two, when we talk about ratio, um, uh, Julia Stone, the Australian legal philosopher, described it in the English system as the deepest secret of juristic life. Um, it's unknown in the law schools here. And three, I haven't heard anybody talking about, and I wonder if you have been thinking about, uh, these issues of, of stare decisis, precedent, originalism even, are not unusual and unknown outside of the Anglo-American legal world. They are treated rather differently, and I think rather better, uh, in the continental world. Have you, have you, if you haven't factored this in, I encourage you to do so. Thank you. Anyone want to comment at me, Yvette? Uh, well, I think an originalist would have difficulty uh, factoring in these considerations from outside the Anglo-Saxon wor world, although it certainly is a matter of interesting uh, comparative law. Read Jefferson. Uh, Jefferson is, is rarely a good guy for an originalist. <laughs> you know what the revised was? Yeah. Um, we have uh, Yvette Hall. Uh, to try, I, I, for, just about running out of time, uh, two, two, two other questions. Uh, Lee Otis and Professor Warren. Lee Otis. Uh, yes, John, uh, I am wondering what kind of thing you're doing when you're deriving your rules of precedent. It didn't sound to me like you were, you said you're not doing original methods. You say that it's authorized by the judicial power. Um, are you doing construction? No, we're, look, we're looking at... <laughs> uh, no, because it's not going to a question of meaning. What construction... The, the, so let me just give a slight primer, at least to how I understand matters. So what I think uh, uh, we look for uh, in the debate about um, uh, meaning is the question of how fully we can figure out what the meaning of the Constitution is. And there are some aspects, some people think that uh, a lot of the meaning of the Constitution is pretty radically undetermined and we have a construction zone. And I, I'm not actually necessarily saying there might not be some construction zone. I tend to disagree that it's a very large construction zone once you bring in the methods for which people uh, refined the uh, way of determining meaning uh, and uh, have a variety of rules like the 5149 rule, figure out how vagueness really becomes different kinds of ambiguity. So that's the debate about meaning. Precedent's not a debate about meaning. It's a debate about uh, the common law. And once one decides something is a matter of the common law, I don't see it as a matter of construction in that sense about trying to figure out the meaning of a provision or saying the meaning is underdetermined. It's a matter of deciding, well, should you, should you, give, pre should you give precedence uh, in certain circumstances to precedent or the uh, best meaning of the Constitution? A, a, a matter that, as I've tried to suggest, that in English law was understood to be a, a legitimate way of proceeding. So once one decides that's a matter of general law, there are, there's a view that uh, judges can work the general rule pure. They've taken into account a variety of considerations, and they come up with the best view of rules given those considerations. And those considerations can change over time. They can change in different contexts. They can change in different contexts from statutes and from the Constitution. So I think this is a different kind of enterprise than either original <laughs> methods or original public meaning. It's a matter of the debate about uh, general rules in the common law. And there is space for that debate in the Constitution because it is this legitimate part of the judicial power uh, that is authorized by Article Three. I, I think John has just described in his third category, constitutional construction, in the sense that it's not about meaning, it's about giving legal effect to meaning. And, the, and his theory of stare decisis is a way of giving effect to legal meaning, uh, to the meaning of the original meaning of the text. And so that is 
they're the core definition of what construction is as it's been defined by those people who think it's, it, it exists. Um, so it isn't a third thing out there, it's that's the thing it is. And I'm, I'm actually pleased to see John acknowledge um, that his view of stare decisis is a third thing that is unrelated to original methods. I'm a little surprised, but, and maybe he'll take it back. He doesn't, you're not committed to this, no, John. I, this is, but, this but, is, but at the moment, at this moment, um, it's a third thing. It's not original methods, therefore it's not original meaning. He's just insisted, and therefore, in my view, it is not, not only, and I'm not talking about the law of excluded middle here. There, there could be more things, but there is a thing called constitutional construction, and he's just described what that thing is. It's giving legal effect to original meaning, which is not the same thing as ascertaining original meaning. Uh, we're, we're, we're I over think we're time, out of time. We, can, we don't have time very for quick. <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll be very quick. Uh, so we heard a little bit about the supremacy clause and the judicial power. I want to hear more about the oath clause, and I wonder if, if that might actually compel um, start decisis or ignoring original meaning. There's some interesting precedents, historical precedents for ignoring original meaning when the consequences would be dire, at least presidents ignoring original meaning. Thomas Jefferson's one example on the Louisiana Purchase. He never reconciled himself to the constitutionality of that and he said, shall the whole nation be lost by scrupul scrupulous attention to the constitution in this particular instance? And then Abraham Lincoln said the same thing. Uh, when he suspended habeas corpus. When Congress was in recess, he said, shall the whole nation be lost? Shall all the laws, federal laws, fall into unexecution? Shall, shall they go unexecuted for scrupulous attention to this one law? So I wonder if, and, and they defended their views on the oath clause, the, the necessary, the, the oath to defend the Constitution and the nation as a whole. Now, I know judges have a slightly different oath, but my question is, could an oath to support the Constitution as a whole compel ignoring original meaning when the consequences would be dire, for example, when there are these entrenched non-originalist precedents, and maybe even ignoring original meaning in the first instance sometimes? With all due respect, um, uh, and I mean that with all due respect. You always say that. I always respect. Mean that. Um, uh, that's I not, never that's doubted not, it. That's not what that preface normally means, but I, I, in this case, I mean it. Um, um, with all due respect, that is a, not a question on the topic of this panel, which is the role of stare decisis. It's a question about the limits, if any, to the constraint principle uh, that is part of originalism. And the constraint principle, to re refresh your recollection from earlier, is that uh, constitutional actors ought to, ought to follow or somehow have their decisions informed by or dictated by original meaning. But it, this is a question of whether that principle is ever defeasible. Uh, a principle could be a moral normative principle and still be defeasible under extreme circumstances. And your question, your very interesting question, uh, just raises the issue of whether this constraint principle is defeasible or not defeasible and under what circumstances. But it really is a separate topic than the one under discussion now. Well, I want to thank the panel for a wonderful discussion. Thank you.